Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Habita fillah Continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram The comprehensive book Bab al-bir wa sila The chapter of Kindness And Maintaining the ties of kinship. And we reach the hadith, hadith 1255, and our discussion prior to this was around those ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned by Imam ibn Hajr al Askalani, rahmatullahi rahmatin wasi'ah, about the issue <coughs> of being. Uh, around the issues of being obedient to one's parents and some of the punishments uh, for doing otherwise and the reward and recompense in this life for following that command and and adhering to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded ma amarullahu bihi and Yusuf, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded for us to maintain, and that is the ties of kinship. <clears throat> and the hadith at hand is the hadith narrated Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah's pleasure is in what is pleasing to parents. And Allah's displeasure is in what is displeasing to parents. A Tirmidhi reported it, Ibn Hibban, and Al Hakam graded it, Sahih or as uh, authentic. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it affirms uh, the hukum of <coughs> being obedient to one's parents that this is an obligation. And this hadith, even if you will, takes it to another level in which <clears throat> showing us that the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is or the conformity of the pleasure of one's parents is in con as long as it's in con uh, conforming to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, then it is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important for us to understand that and we're going to talk about some of the issues uh, pertinent, <clears throat> relevant to this in that, for example, what if our parents, their pleasure is in disobedience to Allah? Then of course the answer is then <clears throat> that would be impermissible to uh, follow that and that would not be the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as is implicit in the uh, or is explicitly mentioned and likewise what if our parents pleasure is in something which is not <clears throat> necessarily uh, you know it is something that's mubah that is uh, you know permissible in its origin and has no hukum attached to it <clears throat> meaning that there's no punishment, no uh, reward for doing it, but it's something that they they want, but it comes at the expense of the harm of the uh, to the one involved, meaning yourself, or that it has no benefit for even the parents, but it's just something that they like and it has no benefit. So then, what about a scenario like that? So we will we're going to touch on that from a statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah as we get into this hadith. So in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we see that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure uh, of the parents, meaning that if we're seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or that the parents, 
those things by being obedient to our parents, then this is being obedient to Allah. This is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the parents, uh, by pleasing the parents, then this is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that there's definitely some uh, details with regards to that. And as we mentioned, the first scenario is if your parents do not, uh, they want something muharram for you. Maybe your parents are not Muslim, maybe your parents are Muslim. And they want something which, uh, based on their limited knowledge or whatever the case may be, <clears throat> they want something which uh, requires disobedience to Allah. Then in that, we do not obey them. And there would be no uh, seeking the pleasure of Allah through disobedience to Allah, even if it means obeying the parents. So it's very important. The uh, Prophet said, La, la masiya. <clears throat> la ta'a fi uh, la la ta'a li makhluk fi ma'siyatillah o kama qal that there is no obedience to the creation at the expense of obedience to Allah you know meaning that by committing disobedience to Allah. So if you, yeah, so if your government, if your parents, if your whatever authority figure calls you to do something which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, clearly, you know, it's Muharram. For example, they say, I want you to smoke weed because it is the common custom in our society to smoke weed. This is an extreme example, but just to make this clear. <clears throat> so it would be impermissible, impermissible for you obviously smoke weed because it's an intoxicant and <clears throat> by being obedient to your parent or your government or whoever that has authority over you and orders you to do this that would be at the expense of obedience to Allah because that would be uh, obedience to the creation by doing an act of disobedience to Allah so that is completely muharram impermissible <clears throat> and that is not seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is not what this hadith is ordering us uh, to do. What we learn from this hadith, some of the fawa'id or benefits of this hadith. First, this hadith uh, encourages us to seek out the pleasure of our parents, to do those things which please our parents. And as we mentioned, that is not in its absolute, uh, that is not absolute. That command is not absolute because, of course, if your, your parents want disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they want wickedness, they want sinfulness, they won't say, hey, we live in America, we live in Sweden, we live in Germany, we want you to have a boyfriend, for example. We don't want you to wear hijab. We don't want this and we want this. Then, of course, that's impermissible to obey them in those affairs <clears throat> uh, but as long as it uh, is in uh, in conf conformity to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with there's benefit in it then this is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by seeking the pleasure of one's parents as well uh, another benefit of this hadith and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith uh, affirms for us the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is one of his sifat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sifat of rida that this is a uh, characteristic or attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has pleasure <clears throat> and that he is pleased with his servants when they are obedient to him. And he is displeased when they are disobedient to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a sifa min sifati la subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another benefit of this hadith and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith is a stern warning against disobedience to one's parents and doing those things which displeases them uh, and the reason for that is that incurs 
the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And especially when, uh, if they want something which is uh, permissible and halal, and there is a fa'ida in it, and there is some benefit in it as well, then by being disobedient to them, then this is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith And this brings up the qa'ida I wanted to mention that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, La tajibu, la tajibu ta'at al-walidayn illa fi ma fihi naf'un lahuma wa la darar ala al-ibn fi. So that's very important. This is a qa'ida, uh, a principle. Ben Uthaymeen mentions this is a qa'ida or a principle uh, that is deduced that Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi rahmatul wasiyah that he deduced and derived from his textual uh, analysis of Kitabi Allah wa Sunnat Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sabil of the Salaf al-Saleh Ridwan Allahi alayhim and it is that there is no obedience to the parents except in those things which have benefit for them and do not cause harm to the child or you know the, the, the by doing this command we need a tesawar we need an idea of what this means as an example for example if a person if a person uh, their parents say to them I want you, and this is a common uh, in in many communities uh, that are more traditional, that a lot of times the mothers have such a impact in the life of the the children that sometimes they, if the mother does not like the the daughter of her son or something, she may order him to divorce her and intervene in their marital affairs. And this happens in many, unfortunately, many customs, which is not uh, Islamic. This is un-Islamic behavior. And so in this situation, the pleasure of that mother, and we know the mother's haq is, is right, it, it, I mean, is, 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 uh, you know, is a very important right and very uh, highly valued in Islam, but she is ordering to do something which is harmful to her uh, she's ordering with something which is harmful to her child and Thanian secondly is also no benefit for her except that she has hasid she has something in her heart against her daughter-in-law then this would not it would not be permissible to obey her in this and secondly uh, this conforms with the qaida and the, of, what, of what we're talking about that there is no benefit in there's no benefit in that for her and there is only harm in that for the son so I hope that scenario is clear that that shows that that's another restriction with regards to uh, being obedient to one's parents, that it's not ala itlaq. If they order you to do something muharram, no. If they order you to do something which even if it's normally could be something which is permissible, but there's really no benefit in it even for them. But they just, you know, want that and it's causing a hardship on the child, then no. So very important uh, and uh, for us to have this this understanding uh, and, and, and be able to uh, to deal with these uh, these scenarios, uh, another scenario which comes up out of this, and what Ben Ben Othaymin mentions another mesala. He says, "What if the right of the mother and the father? I mean, what if the mother and the father disagree over something, and their haq." 
you know, both of them have the hak of obedience from their, their child or children. What if they disagree over something which they both have a right, a share in, a right in? Then, of course, we operate by other nusuls. We look at other nusuls. Uh, the text where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked about the right men ahaqqa nas bi husna suhbati you know one of the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and he asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has the greater right of my companionship the greatest right of my companionship the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said ummak thumma ummak thumma ummak Thumma abuk. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned three times your mother. Your mother. Your mother. Then your father. So it shows that the obedience we would make taqdeem to the mother in this scenario. Because her right is, as is mentioned in the Nasus. Uh, you know, is greater. Another uh, benefit uh, and there are many uh, Messiah that are uh, Far'in, or they branch out from these these uh, benefits and issues, which would take away from uh, sticking with our our nasus, and because of our time restriction, time constraints, we won't uh, continue on, and in some of those masail. Moving on to the next hadith. Narrated Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, By him in whose hand is my soul, a slave of Allah does not believe perfectly till he loves for his neighbor or his brother what he loves for himself. Mutafakun alayhi. This hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That he said, the Prophet Sallallahu said, By him in whose hand is my soul, a slave of Allah does not believe perfectly till he loves for his neighbor what uh, his neighbor or his brother what he loves for himself. Mutafqun uh, alayhi, hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it shows us moving on and referring to, it's still under the bab of Al-Birr, and Sila, this is other relations. These are talking about other relations which may not be f family ties, but rather these are the, the rights and the ties of our neighbors, the rights of our neighbors upon us. And uh, something very important here, and we'll get into that, but this, with, with regards to this Nas, this text, and other texts, is the Prophet والسلام, said, in the text itself, he salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi said, uh, La yu'minu abdin hatta yuhibbu li jarihi O li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsihi So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he negated iman, and we talked about this prior to this. Uh, he negated Iman in there. So if we just look at the Dahir of this Nas, we would understand, and this is the difference between Ahlul Sunnah and some of those extremists like the Khawarij and other sects, is for example, the Khawarij, they look at these Nasus, and that's why they're referred to the, as the Wa'idiyah, the uh, groups which uh, focus on the punishments instead of the mercy and other texts which illustrate the mercy of Allah and the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu and the mercy of the Shara. So they focus on only on one aspect and they also interpret the text in a very literal way in which they avoid or negate at times or subjugate 
those other texts would show the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. So we see that here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began by saying, la yu'minu. You know, after he swore by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, by him whose hand my soul is in, one of you does not believe. So here, if we look at the Zahir of the Nas, the, the apparent meaning of the text, we see he negated Iman. La yu'minu. You know, meaning if you don't do these things, you don't believe. Okay? If we understand it like the Khawarij and the Wa'idiya, we'll understand that this is a negation of full Iman. I will, we'll understand that this is a negation, yeah, of Iman Mutlaq. You know, complete uh, the, the, the uh, you know, Iman in totality. Meaning that the person who, who doesn't do these duties is not a Muslim, not a believer. But this is a khata, this is a mistake. Rather, Ahlul Sunnah looks at the other Nusuls and puts everything in their proper place that this text, this is in reference to Iman Al-Kamal. Meaning, the uh, the uh, having to do with the level of Iman, the completeness of Iman. This, te this text is in reference to the completeness of Iman. So, we understand it by saying when he says, La yu'minu ahadakum. When one of you does not believe who does not do this and does not take care of their neighbor and does not uh, want for their brother what they want for themselves, meaning that one does not fully believe, meaning that they have a nux in their iman. By not doing this, it doesn't negate their iman in totality, but rather it means their iman is nux. This is the faham or the understanding of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah with regards to uh, these texts which refer to the uh, the Wa'id, you know, the, these texts which refer to punishment uh, that are similar to this. And so here we see some of the benefits we gain from this hadith. First, we see that it is permissible to make a qasam, you know, to swear in this manner, in the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did if, if necessary. It's permissible. The Prophet والسلام, said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By the one whose hand my soul is in. So this is, it shows us it's permissible to say this, to make a qasam like this, if one needs to make a qasam. Uh, and uh, that was what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows that it is also permissible to swear like this if you're not asked to do. For example, in court or whatever the case may be, or someone asks you, no, swear by Allah on this, that it's permissible for you to do so without being asked to do. However, not to be abusive of it and swearing by Allah of everything you do. Wallahi, I went to the store. Wallahi, I drove my car home. Wallahi, I went to work yesterday. You know, everything you say in Wallahi and, and, and swear by Allah. No, it's not something to be taken lightly and you should definitely not do this if you're lying or something like this. Another uh, benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith also shows us uh, the point that we were mentioning prior to this is that this hadith it negates iman and we're to, and when it the negation of iman here is a negation of kamal of of, of the completeness of iman of uh, not that iman uh, the, the person possesses no iman but it, rather it means it's a it's it's talking about Kamal uh, the 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 completeness of one's faith but not their faith in totality so that this hadith shows us from those texts of the Wa'id of the threat that have the threat of punishment such as this that the one who does not love for his neighbor or his brother what he loves for himself this shows a weakness in Iman it does not show that they have no Iman so that is how we understand 
this text. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows that in the shar that it is permissible to negate something uh, to negate that something exists that is referring to the negation of it in its completeness. So we see many of these texts, and we're talking about the Nasus from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah so I said that we have ayat and we have hadith which, which do this. That does not mean that we do this ourselves and we implement by saying, by negating someone's iman, saying you do not believe, you're, you're not a Muslim. You know, because this is dangerous because this opens the door to takfir and can be understood that you're making takfir of someone. So we have to be careful uh, in falling into this. And there are so many nasus which illustrate this. Um, for example, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala when uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, La salat bi hadra ta'am. Yani, that there is no prayer for the one who, when food ha is present. Okay, so for example, it's Maghrib and your dinner is served and you're hungry. Uh, and in that scenario, la salat bi hadra ta'am. That does not negate that the fact that you have food there, your salat is negated or uh, that you, you should not make salat at all. No, but rather it means the kamal mustahab, the, uh, that it is recommended to, uh, especially if you're hungry and your food is prepared, that you eat something before praying. So that way you don't go to the prayer and you're hungry and it disturbs your, uh, it disturbs your prayer. Meaning you're just thinking about your food, you're thinking about getting out of the prayer, and you spend more time on that. Likewise, the hadith which also mentions, uh, where the Messenger of Allah mentioned about the one, uh, and also by, you know, the one who, uh, for there's no salat for the one who, you know, basically is holding their need to uh, go to the restroom. So it's showing us it means that, for example, if someone is holding, sometimes this happens. Sometimes a person doesn't have time and they want to catch the jama'ah or whatever the case, and they do need to go to the restroom, but they still have wudu. And sometimes it builds to such an extent and it could dis disturbs their prayer. But it doesn't mean that the fact that you had that pressure before you entered Salat, that your, your Salat is invalid. No, but this is a, uh, a warning that this is negating the completeness of your prayer if this is going to busy you with thinking about getting out of the prayer and going to the restroom over being attentive to worshiping your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala during the prayer. So this doesn't negate uh, the wujub, the, the obligation of prayer, or that you are making prayer, but yet it's a uh, illustration or it's in, an encouragement to uh, instead use the restroom, you know, and come to the prayer without the, those pressures of having to use the bathroom or ikramakum Allah, or pass gas. So those there's many nasus uh, like this uh, that we have in, in the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which illustrate this principle for us. In the next hadith, hadith 1257, narrated Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an I asked Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which sin is most serious. He said to attribute a partner to Allah though he alone has created you. I asked what next? He replied 
to kill your child, fearing that it will share with you in your food. I asked, what next? He said, to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. Mutafakun alayhi. This is a hadith agreed upon in Bukhari and Muslim. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, this hadith makes bayan or clarifies the most serious sins. And that from amongst those sins, and why it's in the comprehensive book, Kitab al-Jami' and Bab al-Sila and Bir, is that it illustrates what goes against those excellent characteristics and mannerisms as exhibited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that the opposite of keeping ties and a connection and the rights of the creation, especially the sila and bitter, would be to actually kill and harm those who you are ordered to uh, care for and to love and to cherish and keep ties with. And from amongst those individuals is uh, one's children. And this hadith, it shows that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een and specifically Ibn Abbas uh, uh, specifically uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an were concerned with real talib al-ilm authentic talib al-ilm and as we mentioned prior to this that the Salaf al-Salih radiallahu ta'ala that some of the Salaf used to say Talib al uh, Talib al Jannah. That seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. So the Salaf, they used uh, they used Talib al Ilm. Talib al Ilm was a wasila for them to come closer to Allah and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a, a wasila to Jannah. It was the means to get into paradise. And asking questions is a part of that talab al-ilm. That's actually requesting and, tal and, and a talab yeah, has to do with a, you know, a, a part of it is to request. That's one type of talab. It could also be uh, a, an, an am, a amr that, uh, or a command. And so by requesting ilm, requesting knowledge, which is beneficial, the ilm al nafia ilm that will benefit you in the hereafter, uh, in this life and in the hereafter, that this is ilm, which is uh, the true talab al-ilm, which is worthy of seeking. And this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, who said, Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi, Man salaka tariqan yal talmasuhu bihi ilman sahhal Allahu lahu tariqan al jannah That whoever traverses the path of knowledge and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make easy for him the path to Jannah. And so we see this illustrated by the questions of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an. And he was one of the of those Sahaba who was most vigilant uh in asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this shows the excellence of uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and in this hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned characteristics which are mathmu. These are negative, sinful characteristics. And he mentioned first and foremost the a'dham. As Imam Muhammad mentioned in his treatise, uh, Asul al-Thalatha, he said, al-a'dham, 
مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَتَوْحِيد وَأَعْظَمْ مَا نَاهَا عَنْهُ الشِّرْكِ He said that the greatest thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us with is Tawheed, is to worship Him and Him alone. And what goes against that? What negates that? He said, and the most severe thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from is shirk, is ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why it's very important uh, as a faida, the talab al-ilm should be a part of getting to know those things which Allah loves and avoiding those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And that means you have to have ilm of, of that. So that shows us the fadail or the, the fadila of ilm, of ilm al -nafi. It shows us the benefit of seeking beneficial knowledge because beneficial knowledge is going to help you get to Jannah. Beneficial knowledge is going to detail those things which help you get to Jannah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and detailed knowledge of those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates and those things which, uh, which means those things which are sinful and detested by Allah Azza wa Jal. So, that shows us the importance of na of knowledge of ilm al nafia and that ilm al nafia is the religion is ilm al deen and from amongst those sinful characteristics as we mentioned is shirk so that's why it's very important and as Imam Muhammad said wa a'dama naha anhu wa shirk and the greatest thing that Allah, the most severe thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from is shirk is polytheism is associating a partners a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala someone else, or worshipping other than Allah azza wa jal. That is shirk. And so here, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about those, character, those things, uh, which, uh, you know, you know the, the sins that were the most serious, and then what after that, and what after that, and the Prophet sallallahu mentioned these characteristics, these sins, which of course are mid, uh, mid-moon. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions also about the, the concept of worship. The concept of worship in the Ahl sunnah You know, to Ahl sunnah what is the concept of worship? Uh, as he mentions uh, that... العبادة هو اسم جامع لكل ما يحبه الله ويرضاه من أفعال وأقوال الظاهر وباطن. That worship, the concept of worship, عبادة, is encompasses uh, everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from those actions and statements which are open and hidden. So that lets us know that's a comprehensive term of what ibadah is. And likewise, the opposite is those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests from what we do openly and in private. And those things which violate that concept, the concept of ibadah, or the concept of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third grievous sin that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in this uh, in this hadith was that a person entuzani halila tajarika, and that is to commit uh, a, adultery or fornication with your neighbor, or right, with your neighbor's wife. So here the Prophet وسلم, is letting us know what is one of the most grievous sins. So meaning that all of these are from Kaba'ir. These are all major sins. And that from amongst those sins is that a person commits zina with his neighbor's wife. So it isn't just that a person has committed zina. That's a wicked, grievous sin in and of itself. But what's even a shed, what's even more severe is that a person violates the trust and the respect and the honor of his neighbor 
by committing this crime with his wife. So it shows us that there that, that sins are to follow it, that sins have different level, and that the violations even of zina has different levels. Some is more severe than others, obviously. You're doing more harm and there are more additional ways of, uh, uh, of negative and sinfulness even though the sin is under one category of sin, meaning zina. That committing zina, you have violated your neighbor's right, which the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in, 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 in our discussion about the hakuk, some of the rights, the rights of the neighbor is something which is very, very uh, serious in Islam as well. That your neighbor, that this is from the haq, from the hakuk uh, of the uh, the the uh, of the creation, is that your neighbor has very serious rights over you. So when you, akramakum Allah, commit such a sin, then you have violated two uh, rights, in essence. The right by committing the sin of zina. So you zalamta nafsik, that you oppressed yourself by doing this sin, because it's a, a sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates and detests, and mentions that, that it's a characteristic not of the mu'mineen, because the mu'mineen they uh, preserve themselves, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Surah Al-Mu'minun wa ghayr. And that the second way or the second violation that has been committed is the right of the neighbor. And as the neighbor is also mentioned in the shara' as having such a great status. And we find a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that in one hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I thought the neighbor would be the neighbor was mentioned so much to me by Jibreel that I thought that he would be of those who inherit you know that he would be of those who commit who those who co collect inheritance when a person dies so that shows that it's almost as as if the neighbor the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to almost feel that, you know, the neighbor's right was going to be that along with a, a person's family. And, and amongst the family which inherits. So that shows us how serious the, uh, the, the, the neighbor's rights are. And that by committing zina with your neighbor's wife is a serious violation of their right as well. Of your neighbor's right, obviously. Because that's his family. That's the one that he perhaps he loves, respects, and cherishes, and then you have now come and violated that. Violated and uh, dishonored him by doing such a grievous sin. Wallahu Mustaan. From the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, first and foremost, this hadith shows us. Uh, the hirs of the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى عنهم مجمعين on uh, uh, in, in asking questions and that was they as we mentioned they asked questions for for benefit to uh, to know and understand what was an obligation upon them to. Not just to know whether something was lawful and unlawful, but they wanted to know to make tatbiq, to make practice, to practice. They wanted to know what is wajib, what is uh, impermissible. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also specifically illustrates the hirs of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and that he wanted to know uh, uh, about the deeds which were most, uh, uh, you know, perfect, uh, the most perfect and, and most important deeds, and those and those things 
which were the most severe in sin. Because this hadith, the Prophet uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, I asked Allah's Messenger, وسلم, which sin is most serious? So here he wanted to know, istifsar, uh, uh, you know, to wanted to know more information about what are the most grievous sins. So this is a part of Ilm al -Nafiyah. As we also learn from the hadith of uh, Hudayfa bin Yaman, when he said, Kuntu... Uh, كان الناس يسألون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الخير وكنت أسأله عن الشر مخافة إن يدركني that the people used to ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم about the good and I used to ask him about the evil in uh, out of fear that I would fall into it listen to that ibara uh, for fear that I would fall into it so they wanted to know in order not to commit those sins. So they wanted knowledge, not just for the sake of asking, not just for the sake of testing people, not for the sake of just uh, just information, but they wanted to know so they could practice, so they could come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they could avoid sin. And they could come closer to their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another illustrate of this hars of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala is in another hadith, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ayya a'mali ahibu Allah Azza wa Jal. Qala salat ala waqtiha. Kultu thumma ay. Qala bira walidain. Kultu thumma ay. Qala jihad fi sabilillah. Subhanallah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala in another hadith, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ayya a'mali ahibu Allah Azza wa Jal. What deeds are the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty. So in this, the hadith we're studying now, he wanted to know about the sins. But in this other hadith, it which shows his hirs, al-ilm al-nafi, a beneficial knowledge and those things which are going to benefit him, he wanted to know about those things which are going to bring him uh, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Salat ala waqtiha, make his prayer in its time. So we need to make hirs out of that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our many shortcomings. Amin ya rabbil alameen. Salat ala waqtiha. Kuntu thumma ay. Kala bira walidain. And that goes back to this bab of sila. The second thing he mentioned was bira walidain. Is, is being uh, righteous and kind to one's parents. So that goes back to the whole chapter that we're in. We're in bab, uh, 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 bab al bir wa sila. We're in the chapter of of uh, of uh, bitter you know piety or or kindness to one's parents was sila and and maintaining the ties of kinship so the prophet sallallahu said that that's one of the greatest deeds that you can do in that hadith in the hadith that uh, ibn masood was asking about those righteous deeds those good deeds showing his hitters, showing his 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 seriousness about seeking knowledge that was beneficial and from amongst that beneficial knowledge is maintaining the ties of kinship. And then he mentioned, after maintaining the ties of kinship with one's parents, he said, jihad fi sabilillah. So that shows that that even has a higher station as the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wa salam, which is a run and a refutation of those jihadi takfiris, who, uh, meaning those groups who uh, are excessive in their... Uh, implementation of the uh, of takfir without even uh, the, the right to do so and while, without the prerequisite knowledge and without the uh, rulings as Ahlul Sunnah Sunnati Wal Jama'ah has deduced from the text the book of Allah the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they violate that that's what we mean by takfiri and what we mean by jihadi is those people who uh, call to and practice false jihad and they're excessive in it and that's a part of their da'wah in their call that they call to other than the sabila mu'mineen they call other call to other than the path of the believers because they violate and they have new newly invented matters and distortions of islamic text and islamic principles like jihad fi sabili fi Another benefit of this hadith is, as we mentioned prior to this, that of the to tafawit, that sin has different levels. 
some is greater than others. And likewise, what do we also understand from that? And the hadith we just, the second hadith we mentioned about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, where he asked about the good deeds, is we understand that righteous deeds to, to, to follow it. They have different levels. So sin has different levels, and uh, uh, Ma'al al-Saliha has different levels. It has different levels. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also uh, shows us that the greatest sin that one can commit is shirk. And that is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began when he was asked, you know, what is the most serious sin? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and taj'alillahi niddin wa huwa khalaqak. It is to Make, an, uh, make with Allah, associate with Allah a partner, and He created you. And He created you, His al-Khalik. So that means you violated His right. Because what we understand, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator of the heavens and earth, the, the al-Khalik, yastilzim min hadha, that what it necessitates is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the only one worthy of worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَلَيْتَ الْلِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind in jinn except for the purpose of worshipping me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this is something so great that all of the anbiya were called to this same concept. And that is uh, Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكَرِيمِ وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ رَسُولٍ إِنْ نِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ which تَنِبُوا تَعْبُودٍ that we sent to every nation a messenger to worship Allah alone and to avoid the ta'bud and to avoid those things worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said which also illustrates that this is the haq of Allah so he created you and this is his right is to worship him and him alone he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was said when he was on the on the uh, the donkey with Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala and he and he said Ya Mu'adh atidri ma haqa Allah ala ibadi wa ma haqa ala ibadi ala Allah O Mu'adh do you know the right of Allah upon his slave and the right of the slave upon Allah Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala and he responded Allah wa rasulu wa alam showing that humbleness of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'een and that they wanted to know they were open to ilm the Prophet sallallahu said haq Allah ala ibadi ya'budu wa la yushriku bi shayin the right of Allah upon his servant is that he worships him and him alone and he doesn't associate any partners with him so letting us know that that what that that's the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why the scholars they mention one of the principles they say uh, uh, that Tawheed uh, al-Rububiyya yastelzimu Tawheed al-Uluhiyya that Tawheed al-Rububiyya the Tawheed of, a lord, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship and that be you know that comes with him being the creator of the heavens and earth that's a part of his lordship and being al-Khalik that's a part you know he's al -as that's one of his al uh, asma uh, one of his divine names and characteristics that he's the creator that that necessitates what? What does it necessitate? It's not just that you know that, oh, he created me. But it yastelzimu, it necessitates that you worship him and him alone. Because no one else can create you. No one else created you. So that is the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest sin is to violate that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that you associate partners with him. But he forgives other than that for whomsoever he wills. Letting us know that shirk is grievous. And letting us know that if a person dies upon shirk, then they have no salvation. That they're in the jahannam. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنَ النَّارِ May Allah protect us from the hellfire. Uh, another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is it shows the foolishness of those people who commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially those people who have some knowledge 
And then they go and they violate the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know that it's his right. But then they go back and they don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about those people who left Islam. That they knew once something of Tawheed. And then they violate it. They go back and they violate They go back on their, their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they go back to associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either it could be their own desires because then they don't believe in any God at all except what they determ determine to be right and wrong and what they feel like doing. If they feel like immersing themselves in desires, then they can do so without any limitation, without any shyness. Or some, they leave Islam for Christianity or for some other faith. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith affirms first that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the heavens and earth, that he is al-khaliq, as, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, that, to, that violating that is to intaj'ali lillahi niddin wa huwa khaliqak. That uh, to associate a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he created you. That that's one of the most grievous sins. Letting us know it makes it's an affirmation of what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, created us. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that this hadith also shows us the seriousness of killing in general, but killing one's child. That this is such a wicked sin out of fear of rizq or for any reason. And stemming from that especially and what is similar is people who abort children or actually kill children, kill their children because they're afraid with regards to their rizq. So they commit a grievous, grievous sin as the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned it uh, in order to preserve their wealth or because they are limited in their means that they're afraid that their children will take from their wealth. So that's a lack of iman on their part in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the rizq is from Allah Azza wa Jal and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this weakness because this is the way of the people of Jahiliyyah. And in fact, we find that the Arabs in their Jahiliyyah and in some other societies that they used to kill and bury their feet, their their girls. What kind of society would you have without girls? You would have no society. You can't have a society because if you kill the girls, for one, you're going to create a, a type of homosexual environment, and number two, eventually you you will die off. You can't. You you have to have women. Men and women are both needed. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created created us in pairs and we require male and female in order to preserve ourselves as human beings and to worship Eliza with Jill. And another benefit of this hadith is that as we mentioned prior that zina with one's uh with one's their na their their neighbor their neighbor's wife is one of the most grievous uh sins and we mentioned some of the reasons for that because you are actually violating two rights as we mentioned the right of the neighbor and the uh the you know and oppressing yourself 
by committing such a grievous sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us with a khlas, with thabat, and protect us from falling into those grievous sins. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.